Thank you. What we're going to do now is, I know that you've had many interesting and stimulating discussions in the uh, few minutes that we've been able to allow you to do that. And what we're going to do now is that Bishop Michael has some reflections and ideas to put before you. And the panel will have a, a discussion about that. And then perhaps we'll be able to have enough time to uh, take a few questions or comments, reflections or observations from the floor in that process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne. It's a real delight to be here. Um, I am here because I'm following one of the invariable rules of my Episcopal ministry, which is to do as my dean asked me to do. <laughs> Almost invariable rules, I should say. Um, I just wanted, there's been a huge amount of um, high octane input this morning and I feel a little bit overstimulated by it all but just reflecting on some of that and some of what we heard yesterday and also one or two things as I've wandered around listening to some of the groups just now um, just three unconnected reflections really um, there's a sort of combination for me of what Selena was saying about the place of active solidarity and the role of cathedrals as being a base and a venue for that combined with the question that um, I think John Canessa uh, asked yesterday about who is not here um, and with what Jeff also said yesterday about us not us having a glorious non-monopoly of the good and I think putting those together, there's something about the need in a very clamorous society for cathedrals to be a place where we listen carefully um, to people's experiences, their cries of pain, their hopes and their fears. Uh, not just to listen, but to, to seek to listen actively and to be a place where we can seek out the voices that are not heard and I think what we heard from the story of this cathedral yesterday is that some of those voices may be seeking us out too. So there's something about how we listen actively to voices that are not being heard and provide a place for those and to respond in solidarity to them. Um, the second was just um, reflecting on Anne's uh, imagery uh, of the sanctuary and the ark of being in a place and going out from that place on a floating journey. I said to her, my, um, my youngest son, Ben, lives in Ipswich, uh, very near to the marina. And uh, they, when you looked out of their window for um, about nine months last year, you could see this giant replica of Noah's Ark, which is um, stuck uh, on the marina side at Ipswich, having been deemed unseaworthy to travel further. So there may, there may be an issue about how we, how we make our, our floating arcs um, seaworthy. However, that was not my main point. Um, <laughs> just came to mind. Um, buildings um, and distinguish the building from the space, which I thought was, was very helpful. But of course, that going out or reaching out, whether physically or conceptually, involves a lot of change in and adaptability. And essentially, cathedrals are, uh, are great big buildings with a strong sense of stability. And uh, for m most, I should imagine, of our cathedrals, many of our cathedrals, a Benedictine ethos of stabilitas built into them too. So there's a question about how do we become flexible and, and change in a stable way? I think, how do we change in a stable way? And then thirdly, just, um, just picking up on Mark's um, passionate advocacy for children in our society and connecting that to what Anne said about the ark um, and the word 
um, and I only, only know this because the Children's Society taught me this in a previous campaign, I think, that the Hebrew word teva, which means an ark, is used twice in the scriptures, once for Noah's ark, this giant cosmic structure that saves and renews the world, and the other time for the little basket that Moses is hidden the bulrushes in. So you've got the teva is, is, is the instrument that saves uh, and renews from the waters of chaos, but it can do that in a, in, a, in a cosmic level or at a very individual level. And if cathedrals represent the arc of salvation, how do we hold together that kind of wide, you know, almost illimitable concern for, for our cosmos, for our society, for changing the world with the very, very many individuals who, we, who, who seek our help and who we need to help to assist and save from their own tribulations too. And that works out in the way that we structure our, our working patterns in cathedral. You know, uh, it can feel that, that strategy can take up so much attention that it crowds out individuals, or it can feel the other way around. How do we hold together the two senses of being an arc of salvation, individual and cosmic? I think that's enough to shut up now. Bishop Michael, um, I wonder if our panellists would like to make any further comments or reflections on what we've done today. You have a microphone under your chair if you want to add anything else into the, into the mix. No? Okay. Well, then, would anybody like to ask a question, tell a story, make an observation, or reflect on what Bishop Michael has just said? In which case, you can have one of these handheld microphones. Adrian? Somebody over there. Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we'll do this first. Uh, Rob Trice from Rochester. Uh, it's a revelation to me that Ipswich had a marina. To say, um, <laughs> I can't think of anywhere quite so much far away from the sea. But anyway. Um, my question for the panel, uh, Mark Russell mentioned that government needed to take notice of our children, but ought not the church to be doing the same? Can you tell us again, please? We, we, did, we didn't hear it properly up here. Okay, um, the question was, uh, Mark Russell mentioned that government needed to take notice of our children, uh, but ought not the church be doing the same. Well. <laughs> yes. Um, yes is the answer to that question. And anybody who's known me in a previous life will know I've been passionate for many, many years badgering the Church of England at national level through the General Synod and the Archbishop's Council to listen to the voices of young people. Um, and not just in a tokenistic way, but to ensure that young people's voices are heard. And, and I would want to say that's true for every parish and every community in the land, that we should be listening to the voices of young people. And one of the great benefits of the Church of England's system is that we are in every community in the country. And, and we have access through our parish network to over 1.2 million children through our schools. And I'd want to be encouraging the church to be doing more to listen to those young people and the issues that they talk about um, rather than just, you know, the ones who turn up on Sunday. Bishop Michael wants, wants to tell you that uh, there's been a huge increase in sales at the marina since he made that point. It's on, on his phone right now. <laughs> Does anyone have a question for Selena or something on to what Selena said? Some? Can we have a, a microphone over here, please? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Andrew Nunn. Look. Um, thank you very much for a, a really stimulating morning. And I think just an observation and then a, a general question, if that's okay. Um, the first observation is that for now 31 years, um, we've been the only cathedral to have a chapel dedicated to those who live with HIV AIDS. And we, we did that rather controversial thing back in 1991 because we'd been 
listening to the congregation, to their cries, to their pain and everything. And so we did that. And we've committed ourselves every Saturday uh, for the Mass on a Saturday to be the intention at Mass to be those living with HIV AIDS. And we've never stopped doing it. And I think there is something uh, in that about, A, responding to what the, the, the needs are that you hear in your local place. And they may be quite particular like that. And then committing yourself for the long journey. Because uh, when, when we were talking about AIDS and last year there was an article in the Church Times, it's, it's that kind of long-term commitment that we're looking for rather than the, the sh kind of short-term intervention, which sometimes can work. But I think we're, cathedrals are places that have stood for thousands of, you know, uh, 1,500 or whatever kind of years that we've been standing. And so we know how to work for, for the long term. But when you get presentations like this morning, you know, it's excellent and stimulating and thought-provoking. And thank you, Anne, for making me realize just how important the cathedral shop is and those who work in them. Uh, how do you begin, do you think, to decide which bit of all of that stuff we do? Because we can't do it all. Together we can do it all. But how do we discern what the Holy Spirit is directing us to in the particular places where we are? How would you begin that process? Anybody from the panel want to make a response? I'll attempt this. Um, really great question and it seems to me that you're already doing that work of discernment the fact that you've committed as a community to pray to have a chapel of prayer for those living with HIV and AIDS that's a very special thing that's I've never heard of before and is quite uncommon and therefore suggests to me that you that the decision has been taken as you've listened to those you're loving and serving and you've been led by the Spirit so I immediately wonder, well, what action might accompany those prayers? Because when we think about our prayer life, we can often make that a distinct thing from the doing of justice or the doing of social engagement. And yet I think in the scriptures we're presented with a, a kind of prayerfulness that is proactive, that we act in line with the action of God. And so rather than thinking of all the myriad of issues, and of course there's a th many things that you could also act on, it makes me think what kind of action might accompany that. But also in the same way that you've discerned this need for a, for a prayerful space for this particular group of people, what other spaces of prayer and action might evolve for you in your particular space. Um, I think often people can feel paralyzed by the long list of issues that there are in the world. And we've, I talked about intersectionality and there's like so many intersections of issues. But I think in the same way that you've been led to establish this chapel, it's a sign that you will have that ability to discern together what the spirit might lead you to do. So I would, I would say push into that even more. Thank you. We're getting towards the end of our time really, really quickly, I'm afraid. Um, Austin, would you like to? Yeah. Just offer us something. Yeah, just, uh, just really in response to the question, how do you discern anything, really, in a cathedral? I mean, you have this institution in every cathedral called the chapter. You have chapter meetings. And the chapter is an ancient and venerable um, space for ecclesial apostolic discernment. And in a way, it's about recovering that tradition, which is there in the Acts of the Apostles. So involving people, involving everybody in the discernment of the decisions. The decision ultimately is taken by the dean, by the, by the authorities, but everybody's been involved. They've been heard. <coughs> they've expressed themselves. And even if they don't agree with the decision, they feel part of the process that's led to that decision, so they're much more accepting of it. And so you get the great gift of, of unity of that. So I just wonder whether one of the challenges, I know with all the bureaucratic and you know, heavy uh, financial uh, demands on modern cathedrals, sophisticated major institutions as they are, whether there isn't a danger that that original discerning mechanism of the chapter could not be recovered. It's there in, in your tradition. Bishop Michael, would you like to offer your last reflection? While we Thank you. For the last couple of minutes? Um, just, just to, not really arising out of what's being said, but what's not being said really. Um, cathedrals obviously, as you know, have all sorts of different roles, as great 
sacred spaces, folky for their community, visitor attractions, um, all sorts of centres of mission. I think, in my experience, the most difficult one to get right is the one about being the seat of the bishop, not because bishops are particularly difficult about their seats, and I'd love my cathedral, but because it, it raises the question of what your relationship is to other churches in the diocese. And I think it's very easy, uh, both for cathedrals to drop off other churches' horizons and for other churches to drop off the cathedral's horizon. Um, and I just wonder how, how we can model that better, that relationship with the great murmuring people of God out there in the diocese, um, so that uh, cathedrals can be places that encourage and resource um, rather than, as sometimes happens, be viewed with um, resentment or indifference or sometimes as sources of competition. I think you've got great opportunities for you as cathedrals to develop your own distinctiveness. How do you do that in a way that is uh, paradigmatic for other parish, for parish churches rather than um, exceptional? I think that's, I just don't know that that's a tension that we'll ever solve, but I just wanted to mention it really. Well, I'm really sorry, everybody, but I'm afraid we have used up all the time we have available for this particular uh, session, and I feel particularly sorry since I talk so much about listening to others, and we haven't had enough time to do that listening to, to people's questions. Um, and I know that other people do have questions that they wanted to put before the plenary, so I'm sorry about that. But I don't don't let go of those questions. Hopefully, we'll have time for more conversations. I was sitting in on um, one of your discussions during the, the, the session where we were all getting together, and there was all sorts of interesting stuff going on in there, and I know that that's true for all the, the discussion groups that you've been in. So don't let that um, bubble of interest and stimulation um, go to waste. If you have questions, ideas, observations, stories, or thoughts, please send them to me. Send them to... Adrian, give Adrian lots of things to think about um, and share them among one another. And yeah, okay. <laughs> so thank you very much for your attention this morning. And I hope that you've all got something to take away from it. Thank you so much. Uh, before we go into midday prayer, uh, on behalf of the conference, I'd like to give uh, our contributors this morning uh, a wee gift uh, as a, a memento of your being here and our huge appreciation for what you've contributed. So, Mark. We'll be giving the Bishop of Litchfield a bung later on, okay. Um, we'll go into midday prayer just as soon as we're ready, um, and from there into lunch. And today, because the sun is shining and it's fairly warm outside, there'll be a lunch service station in the, in the courtyard too. So plenty, plenty of opportunity to uh, refuel and refresh. There will be, of course, a special meeting for deans and um, executive directors or chief operating officers, whatever you're called, um, at quarter to two here in the hall. Okay? So we're going to prayer, lunch, fairly leisurely lunch. I'm afraid for deans and administrators, we've got to listen to the Third Estates Commissioner bearing us good news. All right? Thank you. <laughs>